setting up the Union Center at AIT for a long time. He was chasing me to make it happen. And I was not at that time very clear what he wants to do, but we worked together and uh, discussed the details. He traveled to Bangladesh and I traveled to Bangkok to make all the details work out. He was very stubborn about it, that he has to get it done. And finally it was done, that's what the Union Center is all about in AIT. Just about now, three years, all the beautiful ideas that we discussed still need to be translated. Somehow, the progress didn't go very far because uh, he got into his problems of uh, intergovernmental negotiations and so on. And there was not a director who would be running this. So finally, Dr. Riyas Khan came into the picture, he took over, and then he's trying to set it up. And this is one of the examples, the beginning of that uh, effort, how to make it happen. The idea was to bring the business leaders in town, NGO leaders, political leaders, young people, get to come together and discuss these issues, what's going on around the world, about the social business, about the micro credit, and so on. How to see any relevance of these things in the context of that. Because once people have it clear in their mind, they take it over, they continue to work for it. And many businesses in Thailand express their interest in different occasions with me when I'm in different other countries and meet Thai business leaders and geo leaders. But somehow that facility was not created to get to know each other and do that. So that was the kind of a forum or a, or a hub to bring people together to examine. So this is a good start today. I hope this continues and uh, this is the uh, most emotionally charged idea from uh, Professor Irandos. He wanted to get this thing done so that he feels happy that uh, AIT took a role in bringing this together. So with this initiative today, I think uh, it's the first translation of his ideas into the election to see how far we can go. And w I wish this effort all the luck so that at least this dialogue can continue. Uh, quickly, before I get into other details, because my colleagues remind me to always mention this, uh, three uh, blocks of dates that uh, to remember, so in case you are interested in the idea of social business, these dates will be very useful to you. One is June 28, June 28 and 29 actually, uh, social Business Day. This is annual event that we hold in Bangladesh and around the world, uh, particularly focused in Bangladesh. Uh, social Business Day to bring people together uh, within Bangladesh and also from other countries to get together and kind of exchange experiences, what has happened, what's going to happen, uh, what are the initiatives coming up so that these uh, uh, getting together with people, with other, inspires each other. It's, ah, he's doing that, I can do this. Uh, this is a great idea, I can do it this way. So those kind of exchange of ideas and examples and so on. So uh, I extend my invitation and the invitation on behalf of the Union Center in Bangladesh. Uh, come and participate on June 20th and 29th. Uh, lots of uh, delegates will be coming from other countries, from USA, from Germany, from France, from Japan from Singapore, from India, and many places, in Haiti, and so on. So, uh, the delegation uh, or individuals uh, on their own can come and meet all these people uh, and think. Uh, you can have direct connections with them. You don't have to go through anybody, it's individual, the CEOs of different companies, and so on. So this is one in June 28, 29. Another one is uh, July, July 20 to 23. This is in Japan. 
This is called Social Business Forum Asia. Japan holds this every year. Uh, concentrated in Kyushu University in Fukuoka, but it is done through Tokyo and Kyushu and Fukuoka, uh, both locations. Uh, every year it's held. Again, you bring lots of uh, uh, interested personalities, particularly Japanese business leaders, like uh, CEO of Uniqlo, Felicimo, and many other companies, Toshiba and other companies. They come to discuss the future of social business, what they are doing, what they want to do, and so on. So this is in Japan. Third one is a global one. This is in Vienna. Uh, uh, Rias has already mentioned that. Uh, we hold it every year again. Every year is in November, uh, close to the first first week or second week, uh, first half of November. We try to fix the date in first half of November every year. So somewhere in the world, this will take place. Uh, this is called Global Social Business Summit. So we bring again all the top CEOs of different countries from many countries to get together academics get together, young people get together, business executives, NGO leaders, political leaders, they come and go on discussing what's happening around the world and so on. Uh, hopefully next year it will be somewhere in Asia, so far it's even in Europe, so we're trying to find a location, I hope Bangkok can be a good location to hope this global social business summit to bring people together to see what's happening. So this is the three blocks of dates that I thought uh, I should mention. This year it will be November 8, 9, 10. These are the three dates uh, in Vienna. So please uh, visit the website to see a UNIS Center website or Social Business Summit website to get more details. And uh, Riaz was mentioning about uh, unreasonable people. And I was wondering, who is unreasonable? unreasonable? It's me as an unreasonable person he's referring to, or you as an unreasonable person you're talking to, or somebody else. Uh, <laughs> because I thought uh, every time I did something, and other people are very unreasonable. <laughs> <laughs> so don't blame me for becoming unreasonable. And I did that when uh, I started uh, going to the village and talking to the poor people in the village, which is just next door to the university where I was teaching. It is nothing fancy research or anything. It's just personal interest that I wanted to see if there's anything I can do uh, to make myself useful to even one person uh, in the village next door because they were extremely poor and the country was going through famine. That was the whole immediate triggering point. Uh, then I saw many other things, including this loan shark. So I've tried to go to the bank, see they will lend money to the poor people. They said, no, they cannot. They should not do that because that's not the job of the bank. I got very irritated, very agitated. And I started complaining about banks. Not just once, not just twice. It became a habit with me to criticize banking system in Bangladesh. And the very essential part of that uh, criticism was, that banking is a very strange kind of bank, an uh, institution. I said, you, you, the institution is created to lend money to the people, take deposit and lend money. That's what the job of the bank is. But the funny thing is, you give the money to people who already have money. And you refuse to give money to people who don't have money. I said, that's very strange, very unreasonable. So to me, they were the unreasonable people. And I thought it's very logical that the bank should prioritize the people who don't have the money to give the money to them first before they go to the other people. Because they already have the money. Why are you rushing to give it to them? Why don't you give it to the people who don't have money? Because money is so critical, so important to have this. If you don't have a dollar in your hand or money or baht in your hand, you cannot catch another baht. You need a butt to catch a butt. But nobody gives that first butt in your hand so that you can catch the next butt. I thought that's a very reasonable thing to expect, that you give the empty hand a butt which can catch another butt. It never happens. And they say they are reasonable, and my word is in unreasonable. So I don't understand who is unreasonable here. So I continue, they, they were telling me it cannot be done. I said, let's do it together, let's find out. 
I mean, I'm not claiming that it can be done, but we have to try. Unless you try, nothing gets done. So we have to try. So no, we don't have to try, try because it's obvious. Poor people cannot pay back. I said, it's not obvious to me. I have not tried. You have not tried. So I volunteered to try. All I was asking, give the money so that I can try. They would refuse to do that. So after long negotiation, finally I offered myself as a guarantor. I said, I will sign every piece of paper you give me. I will take the risk and you give the money. If they don't pay back, I'll pay back, personally. That was the deal in 1976. And with that, finally, it's not easy. They didn't agree right away. It took me several months more to convince them. Me as a guarantor. I said, I will pay every penny of it. Finally, it began. And I came up with ideas how to make it happen. And the rest is history, it grew and grew. But the bank was becoming very reluctant, even with me signing papers. You know why? Because they thought it's getting big. Now this guy cannot pay back if they don't pay back. This is beyond his capacity now. So why should we take so much risk? So they were very reluctant to give new loans. I got so irritated by that. So I said, why don't I create a bank separate? Now that I know that it works, I create a new bank. So I was trying to create a new bank. Finally, that's a long story. Finally, I got it done, called it Grameen Bank, Village Bank, in 1983. How did they do that? What kind of thing that works, that people pay back and people can benefit from that? How did they design this whole thing? I think it's very simple. People think maybe this is lots of research has gone into it, you have done that. I said, no, nothing like that. I, think, I, I always like simple things. I, 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 my mind cannot think in a complicated way. But, but we are trained to think in a complicated way. That's why everything we do in a very complicated way. So I try to undo that. I said I'll think in a very simple way. See if I can find simple things. So I made it very simple for us, for me. So what I do whenever I need a rules or a procedure of how to do it, lend money to the poor people, I just look at the conventional banks, how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> because if their system is going to the top, bigger and bigger, so if I'm going to go to the other directions, I have to do the reverse. It's very simple. So I did the reverse. They want to go to the rich, I want to go to the poor. And I, that's what I was doing. Their principle is the more money you have, the more you get. So if you have the, if you're the richest person in the country, you get the biggest loan possible. I reversed it. I said, less you have, more attractive you are for me. If you have absolutely nothing, you get the highest priority. And that's what the Grameen Bank is. We're always looking for people who have nothing. In our system, when we look for the poor people, we, for our staff, because they have to understand who is the poor people, we said, well, we always look for a person or a family who lives in one room. If you find one room house, that's the place you should go. That's where the poor people live. But then you see there are lots of different kinds of one room house. So find out whether the one room house has a leaky roof. If it's a solid roof, they can wait. They are better off. Because you are looking for the leaky roof. And you found a house with a leaky roof. Then you see if there are other people worse than that. Then you go a single room house, leaky roof, and no furniture. If there's nothing in the house, then they probably is the one who has the highest priority. So this is how we design things. Again, it's contrary, completely opposite of what the conventional banks do. They want to see how much land you have, how much housing you have, how much bank balance you have. We reverse all these things to find the report. And when you find this poor person with the leaky roof, single room, no furniture, and you talk to the woman, 
And after all the things you discussed with her, that you did this, how it worked, and finally she said, no, no, I don't want to take the money from you. I, I, can't, I, can't, I, I don't want to take any money from anybody. And you tell our staff, don't get misled. She's the person you're looking for. So now you go back to her again and again to build confidence in her. Because she has lost all the confidence in herself. Because history has taken away everything from her. She's just an empty shell. So we have to peel off the layers of layers of fear in her. Because ever since she was born, she was told she is no good. Ever since she was born, she was told that she is a woman, she is a girl. She brought misfortune to the family, being a girl. And always she is apologizing to the world, sorry I'm born here. So she believes as if she doesn't exist. So you have to go back to peel all these fears history has created around her. So that someday she will have just a flicker of a little bit hope that maybe I should try. And that's the day we should be waiting for. Because once she does that, then we start beginning. And she's handled some little money. And if she's successful with this money, her confidence level increases. She took a $30 loan. And she's handling, she's very shaky at that time. But once she pays one installment, two installment, her confidence level builds up. When she pays the last installment of that $30, she's a completely different person. She feels like she can now conquer the whole world because she has done something which she's never done before in her life. So that's the person we want to create out of her. When we talk about my cricket, people are always talking how much loan was given, how the repayment is, what the repayment rate is. That's not the story of my cricket. The story of my cricket is people. How you transform the person. This little money is just an excuse to have this mechanism get started, have the engine in her get started. Because human beings have unlimited capacity, unlimited fear. Simply, society never gave them a chance to use the unlimited capacity each one of us has. There is no difference in terms of creativity in a poor person and the creativity in a rich person. Nature doesn't understand what is rich, what is poor. Nature understands he and she is a human being. As a human being, she is packed with every single capacity that any human being can have. And I give the example. I said, imagine a situation, you know, almost like a movie plot. The two children are born in two different places. One, born on the street, in a family who lives on the street because they don't have home. The child is born on the street. And the same time, the child, exactly the same time, another child is born in a palace of a king. Some by magic, we switch these two babies. The child born on the street was placed in the palace and the one in the palace was in the street. Wait, what happens to this child? The child born in the street, now growing up in the palace, behaves like a prince and acts like a prince and grow up as a prince. The child who grew up in the street became a criminal. So is it in the person or is it in the environment? That's the issue. So if you look at the poor people different, it's not because he or she is naturally different. Simply is placed in a different circumstances. And I also give the example of a bonsai. You know the bonsai tree, that the little tree? I said, take the seed of the tallest tree and put it in a flower pot. It grows this thick. Why is that? Why doesn't it grow as big as the one that you see outside? Because we have not given enough space so that the 
the seed can let the process continue and make it a victory. Because it's not planted in a real soil. I said, poor people are bonsai people. There's nothing wrong in their seed. But society never gave them the space on which to make it grow. That's where it went wrong. That's why they became so stunted. And we look at them, we look, look at them as if they are different. They are not different. Circumstances that we created around them made them different. The seed is the same seed, no different at all. So how do we overcome poverty? If you want to overcome poverty, poverty, your focus is not on the person. Because poverty is not caused by her. She is a victim. She is not the cause. So that's very different thing. What is a cause and what is a victim? Poverty is artificially imposed on her from outside. So if you want to get her out of poverty, you have to change the system which created the poverty. We forget that. That's why when we do the banking, we thought, ah, this is the reasonable banking. That's not reasonable. That's what created poverty. Because you deny somebody the service that you are supposed to provide. So you are giving money to the people who already have money, they make more money, and you give them more money, so they become rich and richer. And you refuse to give the money to the person, say that it cannot be done. Today, 35 years later, after we have done the Grameen Bank, not, not only Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, Grameen Bank all over the world, or Grameen, not Grameen Bank, Grameen idea all over the world. Not a single country in the world is left out where there is no Grameen microcredit program. Every single country has that. What does it mean? It means it has demonstrated it can be done in any circumstances. Not rich, not poor, not black, not white, not pink. It doesn't matter. In all circumstances it works. But the banks have not changed. What is their argument now? Who is the unreasonable people? I hope you'll be with me to call them the unreasonable people. People who do not want to see evidences for one reason or another. We were invited to do drumming program in New York City because they were always saying it cannot be done in your American situation. America is so different, so rich, so blah, 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 blah. I said, this is your story on the top. But the real people are the same. But that the real people is in Bangladesh or America or another country, it doesn't matter. I said, same problem, same issue. They got so pissed off. They said, why don't you show us how that it works in the in, in United States? So we traveled and they said, okay, we'll do it. So in 2008, January, we began a program in New York City called it coming in America and started lending money to the poor people in that city. At that time, we did not know that the financial crisis is coming. It was a booming economy. Remember 2008, in the beginning? It was booming. Everybody is so happy. Life is so good. You put money in the uh, stock market. You wake up in the morning. You are a million dollar richer than last night. You didn't do anything, but you get richer and richer. Oh, life is super good. So that's the environment where we started lending money in New York City. Later half of 2008, we had a discussion. So we have a very interesting situation in our work in New York City. On the one side of the road, huge big banks with kind of a image of those banks, it's, it's infallible, it never can go wrong, collapse, melting away. Money is not paid back, they call crisis, they're becoming empty. On the other side of the road, the program is flourishing. 
poor people taking long day back, not a single installment missed. So I started telling my colleagues, I said, why don't you bring some journalists who will ask me the question, who are critical for it? And I'll tell them who are critical for it. I said, look at the people. The rich people are the ones who are going to pay back their money. It's the poor people who are paying back. You told me in 1976, you don't lend money to the poor people because they are not paid for it. And today, all over the world, they are the ones who are paying. The rich people, with all the lawyers, with all their corner trucks, so what good is your corner truck? You are telling me poor people cannot take money because they don't have corner truck. What good is your corner truck? Have you put anybody in jail? Put their property taken away? You haven't done anything. So what good is your corner truck? You're just looking at them. And you're running after the government to give the money, bail out of money. So who is unreasonable man? So now we have four branches in New York City. We have about 9,000 borrowers in New York City, all women. Average first loan is $1,500. You'd be amazed how eager, how desperate they are to take that $1,500 $1, loan. Where in that same city probably they spend $1,500 for dinner for one. But they cannot get it off for $1,500. In the same city, the group called payday lenders, they flourish because they lend money to the poor people. $500, $600, $1,000. Interest rate, 100%, 500%, 1,000% 1, New York City. And they flourish. The banks don't do a thing about it. I said, you have been telling us Capitalism is such a beautiful solution. Market solves everything. And through competition, all the prices come to the real world. What happened to these prices? You are charging 1,000% interest to a guy. They never became 999%. Then you are having big banks lending money at 5%, 2%, 1% to the rich people next week, next door. What happened to your competition? Oh, ultimately, what ultimately? In the hundreds of years. This is what is going on. So I asked the question, who are the hundreds of people? So today, that's, it became so successful in New York City. Every other city come to us, can you open a branch for us in our city? First request came from Omaha, Nebraska. Do you remember who lives in Omaha, Nebraska? Warren Buffett. His family became very interested by saying, we have not done anything in Omaha. Can you do something for the poor people here? I said, we'll be delighted. If you give us the money, we'll come and do the job. So we had two years back, we opened a branch in Omaha, Nebraska. Just beautiful work. Last year, we were invited to do in Indianapolis. So we have another branch in Indianapolis. This year, we started a branch in San Francisco for the same reason. People say, why don't you do it in our city? They said, give us the money, we'll do it for you. So San Francisco branch is working now. In the later half of this year, we'll be starting a branch in Detroit, and that will be in Charlotte, North Carolina. So everybody needs it. And every, everywhere you go, please come to our city. Said, okay, you, you provide the money and we're ready. We can do that, we have no hesitation. We are not kind of worrying, can I do that? Of course we can do that, people are the same. It's no problem. So this is one story, that how my credit works, how banking system still remains what it is. Institutions are at fault, because we have not designed those institutions in the right way. And still we go on, well, we haven't changed anything. Concepts are at fault. Concepts don't work for the poor people. It works for the rich people. Take the case of the concept of economics, the very concept of business in economics. What does business mean in economics? Any textbook will tell you what business is. B 
Business is a means to make money. We invest, you create a business, you make money. <laughs> and they always emphasize maximization of the profit is the mission of business. So the whole world is, since we believe in that mission, because that's the only thing described in, in economics, in the capitalist system. So that's the only game in town. So we make money. We go into business, make more money, more money, that's right. Because there's nothing else. And we create a money-centric world. In that money-centric world, money has become a habit because there's nothing else. Money has become an addiction. We make money without knowing why we make money. It's an addiction. You can't, you get scared if you don't have money. Oh my God, I don't have money. Oh my God, I'm not making profits. Get nervous. Because we are all chasing money. We are money chasers. Is a money-centric world? We are all money chasers. Yes? Desperately, as best as we come up with all the ideas, all the tricks, how to make more money. And the question that I'm raising, again, figure out who is the unreasonable man. Aren't the unreasonable man? Or those who are saying, this is it. That's what we do in the world. I'm raising the question. Are we as human beings destined to become money chasers? Are we money making machines in this world? Are we robots? But therefore, they do only one thing, make money. I said I understand making money is a means. How would you do that? Making money is a means. But when you tell me making money is an end, I don't understand that. Now you tell me making money is a means and making money is an end. What is this human being all about? Is all about making money? Is that what the fate of human beings is? I said, at least I cannot accept the fact that you describe human being as a kind of one dimensional being. All they do is make money. I think that's an insult to human beings. Human beings are much bigger entity. You took this such a beautiful big entity and pushed it into a very narrow road. Making money. I said you destroy the whole essence of human being by cleaning the structure. First, we must accept, this is my view, we must ex accept that human beings are multi-dimensional beings. And if we are creating a conceptual framework for human being, it has to be accepted in that multi-dimensional multi way, not single dimensional way, which you have done today. Human beings are selfish. This is part of being human being. At the same time, we have to accept that human beings are also selfless. Equally selfless. Not just a tiny little selfless. There is the strongest selfless as there are strong selfishness. If you take these two parts of human being, why don't you include it in the business world? And if you include it in the business world, then we will then we'll have two kinds of businesses. One is a selfish business, where we make money. That's part of us, we accept it. In a selfish business, everything is for me, nothing for others. We concentrate on that, everything is for me. Then we create another kind of business, selfless business. In there, everything is for others, nothing for me. And I do it myself because I want to make things for others. And it is in my capacity to solve other people's problems. And I, I am delighted to do that. So I have two things to do with the economic framework. One, to earn money, and then to use the money to solve problems in a business way. So that's the second category of business, the selfless business, what I call the social business. When you hear the so word social business, that's what I mean. It's a non-dividend company for solving social problems. As the problems can be solved in a social way. 
traditional theoreticians would say, no, 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 you can't do that. If you want to do things for others, you will step outside of the economic world. You will become a philanthropist. You will be charity. I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. I want to be in the business world. You have to interpret me in the business world the whole of way, not part of me. And sometimes I see much more advantage in the social business than in charity. Because charity is not replicable. I give the money in the charity and do a job, which is a very good job. It has people solve problems. But money never comes back. That's what charity is. Charity is a one-way traffic. It goes, money goes, you never come back. It's used, it does a good job. But if I can transform this in a social business, money goes out, it does the job, and it comes back. So I can use it again and again. Charity money has only one life. It can be used once. But if I can transform it into social business, social business money has endless life because it recycles again and again and again. So I get much more done. It's a sustainable thing. People say, ah, you're crazy. Why should people use money to not make profit out of it? See, everything. I said, because I enjoy it. I want to do it because I enjoy it. See, making money is a happiness. The more money you make, more happy you get. I accept that. I have no problem with that. But you do not admit in your theory. Making other people happy is also a happiness. That happiness is completely missed. So you admit only one kind of happiness. Other kind of happiness? No. That, that's a crazy idea. Why should you be happy by making other people happy? I said, you are misrepresenting human beings. That's what the human beings are. They feel very happy when they can make other people happy. So that part is completely taken up. I said, that is the problem of capitalism that we have today. And then we talk about financial crisis. We talk about Eurozone crisis. We talk about food crisis. We talk about employment crisis. We talk about environment crisis. We write tons and tons of articles about all those crises. I said, you bring this crisis as if each crisis is a different crisis. To me, all crises come from the same root. Fundamental flaw in the conceptualization of the whole theory. You misrepresented human being in your central role. And you create problems for each every day. That's why you created poverty. That's why you created health problems. That's why you created environment problems. That's why you created all this financial crisis. Because you misrepresented. Because you think making money is the only thing in the world. If you open it up, you present human being in a proper way, you start addressing those all these issues. So we start creating all those social businesses. I have not designed this social business after I have thought about it. No. When I did Ramin Bang, I didn't design Ramin Bang and start doing it. That's why I told you the story how it began. It was just a simple thing I want to make it happen because people need money and they go to the loan shark, loan sharks get. I was trying to stop the loan sharks. That's how it all began. So I was not thinking about creating a bank. That was not my idea. But since bank refuses to take it, this bank refused to cooperate with me, so I said, okay, forget about it. Why don't I create my own bank? So I created one. Because I thought this is reasonable, they are a business. And I started doing that. Then I saw when I'm giving loans to people, every time I go visit a home of this poor woman, I see something very strange, which I never had any idea. The children in the family can't see at night. They can see during the day, but at night they cannot see. They go blind. I was very puzzled. Here I am coming with a PhD, big degree, from the USA, learned all to see. Never heard of it. I would get very curious, very nervous. What is this? So I talked to my friends, I talked to us, and everybody. Oh, they said, this is a disease. I said, what kind of disease is that? This is called night blindness. At night, you get blind. Let's get a cure. Can you fix it? 
I have not seen in any other country. Oh, it's because of vitamin A deficiency. If children take vitamin A tablets, they will be okay. Or if children eat vegetables, they will be okay. Particularly colored vegetables. And plenty of vitamin A. If they eat it, they will be cured. Why don't you tell them that? Oh, we, we are busy treating patients. You see, our health system is treating patients. That was very strange to me. It's very unreasonable. Why do you treat patients? I said, the health system should be to keep people healthy. You wait people to get sick, then treat. Or you wait for people to get sick. Why don't you stop before they get sick? That should be the health system. That will be the responsibility of the health ministry, of every NGO, every citizen, to keep people healthy. When somebody comes to see a doctor, that is the failure of the health policy. Now we treat the patient, and this is the success of the health policy, that we have so many hospitals. That is, we don't have hospitals. That is the success of the health policy. There is no patient. See, we reverse it. So tell me who's that reason. So you don't feel better, because we don't want to give anything free. In our system, nothing is free. You have to pay. So we made it very simple. Made it one taka, less than 50 cents or about packet. Each packet will have seeds. And people can buy from us and then grow. And they started doing that. It's beautiful. People, they loved it. They feed the children. And we became a kind of a policy and it became part of what we call 16 decision. We shall grow vegetable all year round and feed our children this vegetable and sell the surplus. So the selling is not the objective. Objective is to feed the family with vegetables. And there is so much demand coming as we grow bigger and bigger. So much demand coming. And so much seed we are selling to everybody. We found, soon found that we became the largest seed seller in the country. In the process, night blindness disappeared. What did we do? We did the business. And solve the problem. You see, doing business doesn't mean making money and who cares what happened to the people. Doing business can mean I can solve the problem. We sold the seed not because we saw an opportunity to make money for ourselves. We saw an opportunity to reach out to every single person. It covers the cost so that you're not losing money by selling seeds. So that I don't have to go to anybody, please give me money, I have to give some seed to people. I never, never have to go to a donor. Grameen Bank lends out over one and a half billion dollar today, every year. We don't go to a donor for a single penny. It's all our own money. We take deposits and lend money. That's all. We don't go to the government. We don't go to big, big uh, banks or anybody, international banks or local banks. It's all our money. We have plenty of money. And we never ran out of money. So this is how we try to design. So this is a case fits into what we call social business. It's a non-dividend company to solve the problem. So night blindness was the problem, we solved it. Over the years, I have created more than 50 companies. Each one was addressed to a particular problem. It became a habit with me. When I see a problem, I come up with a business to solve it. So I became a serial company maker. I keep on making companies because there are so many problem. So for every problem, I create a company. And I'm very happy that when I see it's working, people are doing that. Like created a company to bring solar energy in Bangladesh. Call it Grameen Shakti or Grameen Energy. Because 70% of the people of Bangladesh don't have access to electricity. 70%. So when sun goes down, it's all done. There is the same primitive darkness you could have gone centuries back. Still the same darkness. Little kerosene lamps come up for a while because people can't afford those kerosene lamps for long. So they will minimum and then it's over. Day is over. 
So I thought this is also a, a, is a problem, but this is also an opportunity. Every problem creates an opportunity. And now, my thought about opportunity is why don't we bring renewable energy, solar energy? Because we have plenty of sun in the country. Then we designed the solar home system. But it's very expensive compared to the income level of the people in the village. So we'll try to make it easy for people to pay back. We cannot give subsidy or anything. We have to charge them full cost. We try to minimize the cost as much as possible. So difficult to persuade people to buy solar boxes. Fifteen years back, we are struggling to sell five solar home systems per month. We thought if we can sell five solar home systems per month, this was a big accomplishment for us. We struggled, struggled, and finally made it happen. Five solar home systems per month. Then we moved to ten. Then we moved to twenty. Because now people are becoming familiar. Fifteen years later, in 2012, today, we sell more than 1,000 solar home systems per day. And it's growing. People love it. Kerosene price is going up. Solar costs coming down. So it becomes more and more reasonable and people see each other. So if you see next neighbor, you have beautiful electricity, you have television, your children are watching TV, games, plays, and all the entertainment. And your family is still in the primitive darkness. And you can afford it. So you pick up the phone. Say, can we have solar home system? Yes, of course you can. Mm -hmm. So we can stop. You know, it become a big operation all over the country. We'll be reaching million solar home system this year in operation. And once we get to the million solar home system, which will be in a few months, then reaching the next million solar home system will not be 15 years. It will be probably two years. Because now you have the base. So why did we do it? We could make a lot of money out of it. We still can make a lot of money. But that's not our intention. Our intention is to solve the problem of the people. So we created a company as a social business, non-dividend company, to solve the problem. So now that we run it as a business, we don't have to go to a donor, please, like to sell 1,000 solar home systems today. Can you give us some money? Said so we gave you money last year. You can't give you any more money. You are taking up all our money. Because we've become so big. We can become big because we stand on our feet. And that's the, that's the most important part. If you are on, on, your, on your own feet, if it is a kind of system which runs by itself, you don't have to look at anybody whether they like it or dislike it. As long as people that you work with, when they like it, you go right ahead. This is what we do. We are selling improved cooking stove. Because the cooking stove that traditionally we have in all our countries creates so much smoke and fume. Destroys your health. One of the major cause of death of women in Bangladesh is respiratory disease. And respiratory disease is coming from cooking. Not only she is having respiratory disease, her children is having respiratory disease because all the children are always with her when she is cooking. The children love to eat something, so we are cooking, you are feeding your child. So they have this problem. So this is what the situation is. So we changed that. We are now selling solar, uh, sorry, simple cooking cook, cook stuff which doesn't create anything. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do. And then many multinationals started coming to us to create companies, social business companies with us. And we have done this with Danone, which we talked about, to produce yogurt. We are just a problem of malnutrition. 46% of the children of Bangladesh are Bangladesh. And there's nothing we can do about it. So we said, let's try with the social business. So we created this special yogurt, put all the micronutrients which are missing in the children into this yogurt and sell it to the children and make it very cheap, very delicious. Children love that. Mm. So now it's growing and the children who are eating this man, yoga, they're coming out of our nutrition. Then we created a joint venture with beauty and water government. Water is a big problem in our because our water is arsenic contaminated. So we created a small water company to do that clean water from the villages and sell the water. 
Some people criticize us because we are selling water. So the water should be free. I said, water, water is free, but it's polluted water. If you want the water. If you want clean water, the only way you can get it, you have to pay. Because otherwise, nobody, not even the government can afford it. And people love it. People don't complain. It's the theoreticians who are complaining. I said, if you can give them free, go ahead, give them free. But in the meantime, let's do it. Sell it. I'm not stopping you giving it free. But if you're not giving it free, you're not allowing it to sell, that's not a solution. So this is another one. Then we have joint venture with BSF. It's a huge big German company to produce mosquito nets for malaria. These are treated mosquito nets. So we make it in Bangladesh, we produce it in Bangladesh as a joint venture, social business, and sell it very cheap, cover our cost, so that everybody can have this treated mosquito nets. Very good quality mosquito nets and very cheap. People can protect themselves from malaria. We have joint ventures like this with Uniqlo, with Adidas, with many other companies and so on, many more coming. So, if we can produce social business, create social business, so problem, why shouldn't we do that? To say the problems are the area where the government should be focusing, then we'll never solve all these problems. We create the problem, but then leave the problems in the hands of the government. No way government can handle that. So only way we can solve the problems if citizens get active. First, not to create the problem. And if we have created it, we can solve it. And solve it by social business. So we're creating all these social businesses. What I'm saying, every business, whatever business you are involved in, can create a tiny little social business on the side. It doesn't harm you. But if you can create a small social business to employ five unemployed people, just five unemployed people, one tiny little social business. Your big, huge business will not get stuck because you created a small company to create jobs for five unemployed people. But you'll have tremendous pleasure that you have created a company which takes care of five unemployed people. And you created that not for making money, just for making sure they have decent jobs. And if each company does that, imagine how many jobs will be created. Sure. Unemployment will be the real problem in, of the coming days. And you have shown how the young people in Spain are unemployed. How? Is it their fault? And I keep asking that question. Is the unemployed person is unemployed because of his fault? No. Whose fault is this? Is a young, active person, creative person, but cannot do anything? System is saying throw him out. He's not useless. He's not useless. You made him useless. He's a very useful person. So what kind of system is that? I said, why can't we take this system and throw it into the basket? Take good human beings and throw them into non-use. How dare they do that? I said, why should there be unemployment at all? It's because of our stupidity. We didn't know how to design the system so that we all can work the way we want. And now you put it on the blame on the people. Say, so, well, that's the way you are unemployed. What can I do? You can't find a job. What do you mean you can't do it? You created the wrong system. I said, in future, the way we will be coming up, I said, this civilization that we are carrying is coming to an end because it's not working for us, for human beings. So we have to build a new civilization. In that new civilization, the word unemployment will be totally unknown word. Why should, what is unemployment? I don't understand what is unemployment. How can a human being be unemployed? He wants to work. But how can he be unemployed? I, I even make a joke about it. I said, have you ever heard an animal being unemployed? <laughs> what good is this all our knowledge, all our technology and how the working population of the world are unemployed. What kind of system is that? If I raise this question, then you call me un un unreasonable? And those who believe in this, you don't call them un unreasonable? 
That's my question. To find out who is at risk. Because human capacity is so much, we can redesign the whole thing. But we never did that. Because we are so mesmerized by this beauty of the capitalist system and everything. And I keep saying, look, it's a beautiful, fine, but it's standing on one leg. It has no step standing on one leg. So I'm putting the other leg, at least it will bring some stability to it. The leg on which to stand, the social things leg. So then we can use our technology, we use our creativity to solve it. And we can change other things. So this is the challenge of AIT that the center, you know, center to see how to do that. I said, you know, center can what they do, can each year or every half year, they can announce a competition among everybody. Design a social business, small social business, which will able to employ five unemployed people. Just one. Then there are hundreds of those design of Apple car. And you pick the one which is beautiful design. Invest it. And see that it gets done. If it gets done, every other is, oh, I have a better idea. I can do that. Not five, I can make 50 as a beautiful social business. Of course, if you can do it for five, if it's a self sustaining, then 500 is no problem. Five million is no problem because each one, each one is a self propelling engine. So that's the replication part of it. For replication, all we need is a fund so that you can invest in this. Anybody who comes up with the idea, do that. That's the challenge for us. We have the creative power. We have the intention to do it. But the system didn't provide the structure. Social business provides that structure. And once we do that, all these problems will disappear. Human capacity is so powerful. Human creativity is so powerful. In the face of this human creativity, all the problems, all the intricate problems of the world cannot stand for a minute. But simply we never connected. We created a world where all our creativity goes in the direction of making money. And then we say, let government handle the problem. Government doesn't have that creative power. Government doesn't have that technology. It's the private sector, individuals who have the private capacity. So if you connect these two, the problems and the creative power, all the problems will be solved. That's the bridge which we call social justice. I hope we can create that world where there will be no problems, no unemployment, no poverty. And I keep saying that poverty should be in the museum, <laughs> not in the human society. We have come all the way to 21st century to make it happen. And we should not wait any longer. Thank you very much.